Hello there and welcome. My name is Tyler Best and I am one of the Springboard Community Managers. Uh, today's webinar, It's Not All Fun and Games, Gamification as an SBC Approach, is presented by Springboard, an online community under the Breakthrough Action Project. Breakthrough Action is USAID's flagship program on social and behavior change and ignites collective action and encourages people to adopt healthier behaviors by forging, testing, and scaling up new and hybrid approaches to SBC. If this is your first Springboard webinar, then welcome. So what is Springboard? Springboard is an online community of over 4,000 SBC professionals from over 100 countries. Springboard can help you advance your SBC skills, connect with colleagues and SBC leaders, and get inspired through resources, events, and jobs. If you're not already a Springboard member, join today. So we'll be starting today's event with three presentations followed by time for questions and answers. Feel free to use the chat feature on the bottom to introduce yourself and your organization. Additionally, you might want to use this feature to ask any questions for the speakers throughout the event. We'll compile those to use during the Q&A session. Now on to the show. Uh, our first speaker is Faith Gonzalez and comes to us from Quicksand, where she's a storytelling and public engagement specialist. Over to you, Faith. Thanks so much, Tyler, uh, and thanks so much for having me. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm very happy to be sharing a little bit about our work uh, in games. I'm based in India. I work with Quicksand, which is a design research and strategy studio, and we primarily work uh, in human-centered design. Uh, my background is uh, in social entrepreneurship uh, for almost a decade, specifically in education in India, uh, and more recently in uh, health and storytelling. Um, we can... Wait, thank you. Um, today we'll chat through a few uh, kind of key points. I've just put them up here over the next 10 minutes or so. Just um, a quick introduction to gamification, some of its key principles and tenets. Uh, a look at serious games, which is something that our studio focuses uh, more on, uh, more specifically in the context of health. Some of our game work has been um, primarily in uh, mental health and uh, also in HIV prevention. Uh, I'll share an example of a game that we worked on in the last couple of years called Kalpana Ki Kahani, uh, which is in Hindi, and that means Kalpana, uh, Kalpana's story. And Kalpana is a Hindi word that means um, kind of dream or imagination, and it's a, it's a name, uh, a woman's name. Uh, and finally, a few learnings and considerations for those who are interested in using gamification or uh, interested in creating games. Thanks. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, quite simply, uh, gamification is the use of game design elements in non-game contexts uh, versus, say, game-based learning, which is uh, a pedagogical approach where you use games uh, for learning or education. Uh, using games or video games um, for impacting behavior changes is a relatively new field. Uh, and also how design, game design, and behavioral theory come together uh, as something distinct uh, is also an evolving uh, area of study uh, and practice. Um, that being said, uh, gamified experiences such as those which um, I'll share through this presentation as well uh, do focus on the formation of habits uh, through reinforcing rewards or appreciation, recognition, uh, and uh, eliciting and creating certain kinds of emotional responses um, of individuals or players or groups uh, in the game experience. Um, relatedly, uh, in our work also, We've seen how um, it's very important to also think about how games do and can embody a very specific point of view uh, and understanding that um, and how different players or audiences may identify and interpret features in your game uh, is very important. Um, relatedly, how we set game goals, setting very clear game goals uh, through our game elements, uh, encouraging uh, users uh, to pursue these and how they um, focus attention and efforts um, is key. Uh, and these reinforcements um, along the way and along the journey of the game, um, they may be extrinsic or intrinsic. For example, they may um, create feelings or emotions of uh, joy or achievement or overcoming adversity. Um, or there may be actual rewards and trophies and badges and so on in the game. Um, 
on to serious games they may be digital or non digital i'll share an example of both uh, in a few minutes uh, their primary purpose and they are designed um, for a primary purpose of entertainment um, they are becoming increasingly popular um, in um, health um, for example in disease prevention or health promotion issues both for patients um, or for communities um, and also for health professionals um and uh, in this context uh, i'll just take you through i mean there are many models uh, and frameworks of game design and game methodology this is one that um, we've sort of derived based on our experience um and is more specific to serious game design uh, but i'll share that with you and uh, we can go to the next slide please thanks um uh, when kind of examining uh, the question around you know what are the active ingredients or key ingredients uh, of a well designed uh, game or in in our context maybe a well designed health game uh, these are sort of three building blocks um, that you can think of um i think the key thing here to to remember is that some of the the kind of terminologies that are central they may be fluid um and these categorical separations that we're presenting are tricky but what's key is that these are interdependent um and uh, i'll i'll explain how um in a moment um learning is quite critical and it also relates to setting game goals so it's what content do we want learners to to um, uh, sorry players to learn uh, and this can be specific and measurable on um, our your game um so you, um, a lot of our game work is focused on um, communicating and relaying complex um, scientific messages or ideas but through magical real or or relatable um, worlds and game environments uh, and these could include um, the settings the characters the game goals uh, and so on and finally the gamified user experience that involves um, in in this framework uh, three uh sort of building blocks um and i'll just chat through these very quickly and uh, many of you may be familiar with some of this but um mechanics uh which are say the setup mechanics rules how a player progresses in the game so for example scores and levels rewards um those could be individual they may be social or for example badges trophies or leaderboards where you can see how you are doing um and how other players may be doing in a multiplayer game uh and so on um and uh and this kind of begs an important question also um in this context around can game mechanics produce um health outcomes and behavior change in the way that we would like uh, and what we've learned um regarding this is for players playing games it's equally and as game designers it's equally important um to think about what happens outside the game how can a game be in cope created into daily life how can these game skills um actually transfer or to actual behavioral goals uh, and outcomes and this is something we are still um working on trying to understand uh, better dynamics quite simply um player behaviors that emerge for example competition cooperation some negative ones like cheating uh, and so on uh, and game emotions um they are a product of how player are uh, following the mechanics the rules um and so on and um also the behavior or dynamic and these again may be positive or negative so it could be fun and enjoyable at the same time uh, in the game example i'll just share in a moment they could also be upsetting or triggering or worry and uh, kind of going back to the previous uh, point really thinking about how uh, a player will play this game and what happens outside the game is is very important uh, as well um we could quote so and and i uh, again i i apologize is um rushing through a lot of information quickly but i'm very happy to answer questions at the end this is just a quick summary of of the mechanics dynamics and emotions you can skip ahead to the next slide please thanks um this this is just a gif uh, of uh, one of the gated which is called the village invasion uh, for the international aids vaccine initiative and actually all three games that i'll be presenting to you are uh, examples of work that um, the studio has done um, with uh, uh, with them uh, this one was looking at how the immune system works um complex hiv virus within hiv vaccine science um and it's a, it's a digital game uh, 
stay through series of kind of seven chapters or seven minute games. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, this is, um, I mean, this is a working title called Super Bees in the Forest. Um, this is a kicking off production for it in the second half of, of creating. Um, it's a digital game, again, a video game designed to enhance uh, the comprehension of new and emerging science related to HIV vaccine research uh, with a couple of objectives, one being to increase motivations for communities who are participating in research. Um, and also to look at increasing the voice of the community uh, and research, uh, research success. Uh, it's looking at um, uh, specifically um, the germline technology in, in vaccine, uh, HIV vaccine research. Uh, and finally, the third game, uh, which I'll, I'll share in a little more detail, if we could go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, this is uh, on HIV prevention adoption for uh, adolescent girls and young women, uh, specifically uh, in India. Uh, it had twofold uh, objectives, one being um, research and the other being intervention, uh, which made it quite interesting for us and, and very, very challenging, in fact, uh, to create uh, as a game. And we created this game both uh, as a digital video game and then also as, as quite a kind of complex uh, board game. And it's a facilitator mediated game, meaning um, peer facilitators will lead um, this in a workshop format. Um, so, the, uh, and, and it is a social game in the sense that um, for the digital version, players are playing it sitting in groups on individual iPads or, or devices. However, they do keep pausing through the course of the game to have uh, conversations uh, and discuss uh, things that they're learning or questions that they may have through the course of the game. Uh, it, the sum of its objectives included um, enhancing self-awareness on um, prevention of HIV and STIs, um, enhancing decision-making capabilities um, around um, decisions to do with health needs, and finally strengthening agency around prioritizing sexual and reproductive health, particularly for um, girls and young women living in high-risk contexts. Um, I'll just show you a few of the game screens just so that you can get a sense of the kind of questions. So we can just maybe skip through the next few slides quickly. I'll just talk over them briefly for a few seconds. Um, this is uh, the this, this 2D animation film. I just put a quick gypsy you know, woman's uh, journey of uh, kind of navigating uh, kind of the complexities of consent with her partner and uh, she finds out she might be pregnant and she finds out she might have an STI or HIV and finally she's introduced to a potential uh, product um, that could help prevent unintended pregnancy and HIV and uh, through the game of uh, players help um, to make decisions around how to keep Kalpana safe. Um, and there's a story through the video and we can just skip to the next slide. So in the digital version, um, these are just some uh, screen grabs to give you a sense of the kinds of questions uh, both that are gathering responses as well as uh, intervening um, to, uh, to share information uh, with players. So uh, players prioritizing influences, uh, influences and influencers both. Um, we could go to the next slide, please. Um, Player responses being gathered uh, around relationship goals and needs. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, gathering responses on you know, player lived realities, navigating decision making. Um, next slide, please. Um, visualizing short term and long term outcomes of decision making. Uh, and so on. So we can just maybe just skip through uh, these just so that the, the audience can just get a sense of what's on the screens, risk perception. And finally, enabling players to reimagine and change scenarios um, so that they can think about how different decisions will end, uh, will culminate in different kinds of outcomes. This is just a glimpse of the board game version um, of this. Um, and we can skip to the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, I've put a, I mean, there are many considerations. I'll just chat through three of them. Actually, I'll just have a couple of slides here. Um, I think a, a few things we've learned along the way, one being that wherever possible, and also these games are, are being tested at the moment. 
but wherever possible it, it's great to apply rigorous evaluation uh, to raise the credibility of these kinds of games and also establish their efficacy um and um if we could just go to the next slide please thanks uh, and finally um, a note on context, uh, context varies significantly. We're seeing this not just in terms of, you know, the geographical context, but also attitudes and behaviors are diverse. Uh, and the content of a game often, um, despite a lot of research, it can produce a, a simplification of reality. So it's been very important for us to think about content appropriateness, confidentiality, privacy, comprehensiveness of content, uh, other issues also including um, coercion or consent, nego uh, consent negotiation. Uh, and so on, and also the political and social contexts within which these games uh, operate. For example, for Kalpana Ki Kahani in a country like India, um, sexual health is still a very taboo subject. Uh, even when testing this game among young married women, it was quite challenging. Um, and finally, um, a note for you know anyone again interested in um, both in gamification, uh, but also in creating games. How uh, the question around how can we improve conversations among collaborators, game designers, and, and multidisciplinary specialists during the design process alongside um, formative sessions and discussions with target groups or audiences and stakeholders is really critical. It helps to discover risks. It also helps to understand the environment, um, player aspirations and goals, uh, their relationships, uh, and so on. Uh, and definitely help with a higher chance of engagement uh, in real, uh, real world uh, use. Um, and the more that we're able to incorporate diverse perspectives outside of traditional behavior change theory as well, um, we believe is, is essential for serious game design, uh, especially in, in this context. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's all from me. Um, thanks very much and happy to answer. Thank you, Faith, for that uh, that wonderful presentation and those really excellent examples. Uh, we've been getting lots of questions already, so we will be compiling those uh, for the end, uh, and we will move on to our next presentation. Uh, so our next presentation comes from Catherine Bertram, uh, who is a senior program officer at the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs, and will be presenting on the, the READY project. Uh, so over to you, Catherine. Thanks so much. Um, thanks, Tyler, and and thanks for that um, that really interesting presentation. I, I really got a lot out of it, and it looks like a really interesting game. Um, so I'm happy to be with you all today, and uh, really excited to introduce um, the digital simulation outbreak ready. Um, I'll talk through some of the process of how it was developed um, and some of the key areas of learning for the the team throughout the process. I'm realizing I didn't put my video on, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Okay, great. Um, yeah, again, as Tyler said, my name is Catherine Bertram and I'm a senior um, social behavior change advisor with the Ready Initiative um, and with Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs. Um, so first, just maybe a little bit about the Ready Initiative, who we are. Um, Ready is funded by the USA Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. Um, it's led by Save the Children. Um, and it's designed to provide capacity building support to augment the operational and the technical capacity of NGOs to be able to respond to major disease outbreaks. So our current project started um, in April of last year, um, but the program really began in late um, 2018. Um, our focus is on outbreaks that rise to the level of humanitarian emergencies um, and major outbreaks that occur in humanitarian settings. Um, the consortium of partners um, that work on Ready is in the middle band here in this in this slide. Um, so Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs, where where I am from, um, leads on the risk communication community engagement component of the project. Um, and I want to uh, point out that Johns Hopkins Center for Humanitarian Health leads on the the development of the of these digital simulations. So re they really project manage this whole thing. Um, but most of us play a role um, on the development. So what is Outbreak Ready? Um, Outbreak Ready um, is a capacity uh, building simulation exercise um, for humanitarian leaders. Um, and we use game technology as a tool. And by simulation, what I mean is that it's um, a unique interpretation um, of an outbreak in, hum in humanitarian settings. 
So this was actually originally intended to be an in-person simulation, um, but we transitioned to an online format um, because of COVID-19. So we were gonna do a, a traditional in-person simulation in tandem with some of the trainings and workshops that we are gonna be holding, that we have been holding. So um, in this game, players take on the role of an NGO, um, that NGO is, is named Ready, and they make decisions that determine readiness actions as the outbreak is identified in another country, and then how it will adapt um, programs to respond to the outbreak as the outbreak begins to spread in their country. So the countries are, of course, fictitious, um, with a backdrop of a civil conflict um, following a disputed national election. So while we refer to this simulation as a game, um, you can't win or lose here. So rather, it focuses on the learning experience um, for the player, and then it includes elements of everything that you might see in a in-person simulation, if you've ever taken um, one, been part of one of those. So we have multiple characters that are interacting, different scenes um, transitioning from one scene to the next, um, a lot of time pressure, a lot of stresses, um, and decision-making with limited information at times and, and trade-offs um, with those decisions. So like many of these games, um, this one is structured with a branching narrative, um, which means that the learner um, makes choices that affect you know, how the events will then unfold, um, and then the feedback that they're receiving um, from other characters. Um, they also get an individualized report that they received at the end of the game. Um, and, you know, as a lesson learned, we, we, re we recognize that people wanted feedback more often um, throughout the game. And so that's a change we made in a, in a new um, outbreak ready simulation that we're developing, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, so I just wanted to play a bit of a briefing video. So when you um, log on to the game, you get briefed by this video. Um, and so let me just go ahead and play so you get a bit of a, a sense of what that's like. This land is a low income country with a population of 18 million. Just check, can you hear? Yes, thank yes. you. Great, thanks. This land is a low income country with a population of 18 million. Despite its human and natural resources, the country struggles with many challenges, including a lack of infrastructure, economic hardship and weak governance all of which inhibit development efforts. 13 months ago, disputed elections led to conflict and the internal displacement of 280,000 of this land's people. Although violence has declined sharply since the formation of a new government five months ago, the country's situation remains volatile. Responding to the displacement, Reddy established an NGO sub-office in the city of Murel Okay, so unfortunately we don't have time to play the whole thing, but I just wanted to give you a sense of the information that players get um, to brief them at the start of the game. So how do we use this game? Um, we generally use this um, in three different ways. Um, we uh, allow players to gather in teams um, and we hold uh, half day in-person um, and virtual events. Um, as I mentioned earlier, often this is in tandem with, um, with a training. So for example, like an operation, we hold these operational readiness um, workshops and risk communication and community engagement trainings um, as examples. So we would hold um, a half day workshop using this game with um, a facilitation guide um, uh, and team play. So we do that in, uh, in, in workshops. Um, and as I mentioned, um, with that, we have accompanying um, facilitation manuals for team play, and that is available on our website. Um, but then again, you know, every, anyone can play. So anyone could do a solo play. And just to mention, we also have a solo play uh, debrief guide um, available on our website as well. So we've rolled out um, in-person events in multiple countries already, um, and we are continuing to uh, roll them out. In fact, there's one being held right now in South Sudan. Um, and we've been getting very positive feedback, um, as you can see from some of the quotes here. 
Um, overall, there's been over 1,500 different learners um, who have used this game across 80 different countries um, that we've been able to track. Um, interestingly, we've also reached out to academic institutions to um, highlight that this tool could be uh, used in their curricula. Um, and so we've received positive responses um, in that as well. So Yale, um, Prasanna School of Public Health in India, Harvard, Columbia, University of Geneva, McGill University, and of course, um, Johns Hopkins um, are all using this outbreak ready in their courses. So it's really exciting to see uh, how this is being used to train the next generation of humanitarian workers. Um, so now I'm gonna go um, shift a little bit to Outbreak Ready 2. It's a working title um, and provide a little bit of an update on that project and the process. Um, so we're developing this new um, digital simulation. This is our second one. Um, so let me go ahead and talk a little bit about that. So in this simulation, um, there's a, a stronger focus here on risk communication and community engagement. Um, within the health uh, response. Um, it's a 90 minute uh, player led play. Um, player led meaning that um, learners have more agency um, in controlling both the pacing of the game and the order of events in the simulation. Um, uh, so for example, where they go, who they talk to, they have a lot more control in this game versus the, the first one. Um, throughout, the learner is receiving many different types of data, so epidemiology data, clinical data, um, rapid assessment data, and community insights data um, that they then use to assess and triangulate um, to determine how the NGO, how the ready NGO that they're leading, um, how their health programming will respond. Um, so the building blocks that they use, and these building blocks are ways is that the learner receives information um, in order to make the decisions in the simulation. So those are, include a variety of different um, formats. So we use a data dashboard that has all the different data um, that I described earlier, um, a, a building of a response strategy. So throughout the game, they make decisions to build a response strategy. Um, and I'll add to that to build also a risk communication, community engagement strategy, um, and also to build a, um, to add on to a rapid assessment um, survey. Um, there's a map then for players to use to navigate the country um, to decide where they want to go and when. Um, and interestingly, I think a fun aspect, a newer aspect of this game, there are also um, technical experts that are clickable um, that, that players can use um, to get additional information and advice. So there's, for example, a, a risk communication, community engagement offer, a, officer, a child protection officer, and so on. So they can click on those experts, they get additional advice that they can use to um, make the decisions around some of these strategies and interventions. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the development of these games. So um, the first thing that we do is um, develop these multiple different stakeholder groups um, to work on the project. And you, as you can see here, there's quite, um, quite a lot. So the first one is um, an activity team. Um, and this would be an internal core group of ready partners um, who are responsible for the overall development and strategy of the game. So um, I'm also on this, this activity team and we make a lot of strategic decisions about the direction of the game. Then we have a technical leadership group, um, and these are internal and external um, partners, um, subject matter experts in different areas of epidemiology, health, child protection, additional risk communication, community engagement folks, WASH, um, as an example. Um, and they provide input at various points throughout the, the development process. Um, and then we have a pathogen working group that is um, responsible for developing the pathogen that's used in the game. So the behavior of the, of the pathogen, the different characteristics of it. Um, so we wanna get it as, uh, as real as possible, even though this pathogen in the game is, is also fictitious. Um, we have a narrative working group that works on um, the script um, for the game. So I'm also in, in that as well. There are some, some people who are both in the activity team and in the narrative working group. 
And then we have an external um, strategic advisory group of external partners who provide input also at various points throughout the development. Um, and I'll add one more um, group here as well. It's not so much a group, but we also have um, user testers um, that we also use um, in various points throughout um, the development. Um, and just to show you a little bit of a project timeline, um, it is about a year long process of development for this type of game. Um, so we started in, um, in May, June of 2022. Um, really establishing those groups, developing a, a design brief. Um, and then we have what's called different sprints. Um, so these are different, um, you know, different uh, modes of work um, that uh, different buckets of work, I'll say. Um, so developing um, the design brief, um, developing the different scripts um, and so on. So, um, so that's in the development of the actual game. And then there's the piloting of the game. Um, and so we're gonna be starting in July um, with the first pi few pilots. Um, and that'll go through about September um, at which uh, stage we will um, make some revisions to some of our facilitation manuals, for example. Um, and we will launch uh, the, everything with translations included in, um, in January. So we'll have the English only launch, um, sorry, in October, and then the, the January launch with all of the um, French and Spanish translations in January. Um, and just to show you a little bit behind the scenes, um, some of the things that we do behind the scenes to, to develop a game like this. So we will um, develop a, uh, a design document or a content treatment. And this really describes in detail um, the story outline, the overview of the story, the synopses in the, in the different modules um, within the game. So here we have three different modules um, or we call them chapters. Um, what competencies, competencies and skills um, we want to develop throughout this game. Um, what the setting is, and then um, specific outlines, um, detailed um, uh, outlines of each chapter. So what is the timeline in the chapter? Um, what is the briefing screen going to look like? Um, what kind of content um, and information is going to be available for the users to be able to make decisions um, in that chapter? Um, and what decisions are they going to make? Um, and what are those key decisions? Um, and so when we develop a script, we often use something um, like this, um, and this will provide what the, uh, what the different options the learner can choose, um, what the replies from the characters might be, and you, as you can see, the character counts we have to really abide by, um, and that can be sometimes very challenging. Um, and then we offer uh, decisions based on, you know, if that's an optimal decision, if it's suboptimal, if it's bad. And based on what decision they make, where are they gonna go then? What's the consequence of that decision? So maybe they're gonna miss some information because they, they get diverted to a different, um, different dialogue with another person instead of the person that they're supposed to be speaking with um, or the information that they're supposed to be getting. So those, those decisions that the player makes um, has consequences um, and, and to their actions. One minute. Um, Great. In addition to um, the development of the script, we also develop, um, you know, pieces of information that the learner will will use throughout the game. That's just an example. Um, but then, the, you know, in addition to all the narrative and the writing and the script scripting, um, there's also some fun bits um, as well. So we can select different characters. We get to build out the characters in the game, um, selecting the different locations, and even like the ambient sounds in the background. So just some final thoughts. Um, as I mentioned, in terms of development, it takes about a year. Um, there's various different people who are involved. Um, we, do, we did hire a game developer called Anne Range. Um, we have different um, technical experts that are involved. We also had a, have a consultant that we work with um, who is a serious game design expert. He's from McGill University. Um, in addition to different technical experts, um, advisory groups, and external um, user testers. So that's it for me. Thank you so much.
Great. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and last but not least, our final speakers are Wendy Stein and Natalia Sereser, who come to us from Population Media Center. Uh, over to you both. Great, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Catherine and Faith, for your presentations. I'm so totally fascinated with the work that you're doing as well. So I'm Wendy Stein, as Tyler said, I'm Operations Manager for uh, international programs at Population Media Center. And I will be tag teaming with, with Natalia, who is the director of our program design and innovation. And PMC, Population Media Center, creates life-changing popular entertainment for a more sustainable world. This breakaway is our first foray in the world of serious games. Next slide, please. So what is Breakaway? Breakaway is an innovative video game and a mobile phone application. It's designed to address violence against women, bullying and gender equality um, through the universal language of soccer. Next slide. The objectives um, that we, uh, we collaborated with Champlain College as our uh, game design partner. They're one of the top 10 um, colleges for the for um, games in, in the U.S. And together working with their youth and our objectives and our, the objectives that we uh, identified with our funder, UNFPA, we chose awareness of the issue, uh, recognition of personal accountability. So we, we wanted, we're looking for attitude and behavior change regarding violence against women and girls and bullying, and then ultimately also gender equality. Uh, and if um, the, the highest level, I guess, would be that not only would there be an attitude change, behavior change, but the, the um, youth who are playing the game would also become advocates to end violence against women and girls themselves. Next slide, please. The game was designed uh, initially actually for just for boys. That was the, 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 the moment of the light bulb moment that we had. But as we began to work with it, we certainly use, uh, had girls play the game and we pre-tested with girls and we found that they were just as engaged as the boys in a slightly different way. So the story is about a new girl. She comes into town and she, uh, ends up being selected for an all-boy soccer team when one of the players leaves uh, leaves town. And along the way, she's facing um, gender inequality, harassment. These situations escalate over the course of six episodes. And the players, you are the player, you, you're, you who are playing the game will refer to now as the player, and the other team members have to navigate these situations with her. Um, next slide, please. So quickly, we want to show you, you've heard a little bit about it. Now, It's this goes pretty quickly. It is in Spanish and with English subtitles. Um, so we'll get to share with you a little bit about the development of the game, playing the game, see some um, students playing the game in a youth camp situation. Go ahead, please. En 2009, Population Media Center, el Centro de Medios Emergentes de Champlain College, junto al Fondo de Población de Naciones Unidas, desarrollaron Breakaway un proyecto de educación social que tiene como objetivo concientizar a niños, niñas y adolescentes en edades entre 8 a 15 años sobre el acoso escolar, igualdad de género y la violencia contra las mujeres y niñas. Breakaway es un videojuego de fútbol para dispositivos móviles que a lo largo de seis episodios de juego se narra la historia de una chica nueva en la ciudad que desafía estereotipos de género al unirse a un equipo de fútbol masculino. En el camino, ella se enfrenta a distintas situaciones de desigualdad de género y acoso por parte de algunos compañeros del equipo. Uno de los factores claves de Breakaway se deriva de la integración de varias metodologías y teorías. 
incluida la metodología de entretenimiento y educación de PMC, lo que permite que los participantes tomen conciencia sobre las problemáticas abordadas a través de un modelo en el que aprende jugando. Dentro del juego se encuentran personajes positivos y negativos ya establecidos. Sin embargo, el personaje de los participantes que juegan Breakaway tiene un carácter transitorio. Jugar en un personaje de transición significa que el jugador puede tomar decisiones activas, determinadas por su propio pensamiento crítico, ya que el juego conduce a los participantes a distintas situaciones y finales dependiendo de las decisiones que tomen, enseñando así que las decisiones que escogen tienen consecuencias, buenas o malas. También permite que las y los jóvenes puedan identificar en los personajes y en las situaciones que se muestran durante el juego experiencias personales reales a las que se han tenido que enfrentar, llevándolos así a la reflexión, aprendizaje y a una experiencia totalmente personal jugando. Breakaway, adicional del videojuego, cuenta con una guía de facilitación dirigida a educadores, entrenadores y facilitadores para que puedan liderar actividades de grupo reflectivas sobre las experiencias personales y de juego con el fin de complementar y reforzar los temas abordados. Dentro de la guía se incluyen hojas de actividades, preguntas de discusión grupal, resúmenes de episodios y capturas de pantalla del juego que identifican momentos clave. El 90% de los jóvenes que han participado en un campamento Breakaway han logrado identificar correctamente las técnicas recomendadas para enfrentar la intimidación, el acoso, el sexismo y las situaciones violentas. Proyectos como Breakaway son las historias que rehacen el mundo y genera cambios positivos y sostenibles. Thanks. And you can go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. So that was going very quickly and um, just to reiterate some of the points. This was the first social impact game to use um, a PMC's methodology, which is rooted in the Subido methodology. And you saw in that uh, in in that video that we're using positive, negative, and transitional characters in, in the design and the development of the, of the story and the game itself. And the innovation here is that the player, you're the transitional character. You're the one who's going to, you're the one making all the decisions and using a karma system that, is, that combines both the narrative and the choices that you make narratively and in what the tactical mini games are in the sock, um, soccer. So you have, um, that's the gameplay. That's that's where you get those rewards that uh, others were talking about. You know, um, and you play matches uh, and then that's tied into the, the narrative where matches are, are referenced and, and played. Um, there are other things that it, it, it started just as a game and then we built a facilitators uh, a guide as a companion to that game for uh, anyone, people working with youth. And then in addition to that, we added a training curriculum um, and um, assessment tools. So it's uh, it's evolved since 2008 when we first began. Um, all right, next slide, please. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Natalia now uh, to talk more about the camps, having just come right off from um, one of our pilots in Guatemala. Yeah, just last week. So hello, everybody. I'm Natalia. I'm based in Guatemala. Uh, so we'll talk a little more about the, the youth camps that we have been developing over this period of time. So Breakaway, as Wendy pointed out, has been they're out there for 10 years, started in a desktop version and then keep moving as, you know, uh, media has also evolved into a game that it's mobile. Next slide, please. So we had a first hybrid camp in 2021. We had to ev evolve, like really evolve since of COVID how to really build a camp that we didn't endanger anybody. 
So we work with that with the Universidad Rafael Andivar. So the university included in their communication for development side levels, the training of our facilitators. Our facilitators were based in Universidad Rafael Andivar and all our campers were based in Proyecto Puente Belice, which is a school of endangered children. Almost 85% of these children have been encountering uh, dangerous and violent situations, which was a very important place for us to start doing the, the pilot in specifically in Guatemala City. So we had the facilitators in one venue. We got all the, the gameplay through some, uh, some sessions specifically and uh, being able to then gameplay, facilitate, and also very important to do assessment as pre-test and after each episode and chapter. And then at the end, just to see how this change, uh, how this game really changed uh, their behavior and attitude toward bullying and toward violence against boys and girls. Next slide, please. So, what was the camp about? So one of the things is we uh, wanted also to test the likability of the game. We know that this game, it's not supposed to compete with Nintendo games. These games are really enabler to make conversations uh, about addressing these two very important issues that all over the world it has been a lot of conversation about. In this specific one, we had an over 0.4.3 average over five with the overall rating about how they enjoy participating into the youth camps and into the game playing. We had over 100 students between 13 and 18 year olds complete the breakaway hybrid projects. We had this camp was developed during the process of three days, four hours, four hours each in which we do the gameplay. We then do the facilitation activities, which is part of our own PMC methodology in order to really deep dive into the part of rethinking about their own choices and how things are being done and developed. Uh, we tested a new build specifically, and we did research as I pointed out after each episode, and all the facilitation was done through Zoom. Uh, the project included a pre-test, a test after each episode, the play of breakaway, the playbooks with facilitating sessions, and a post-test. Next. So here you can see some of the campers experience, uh, what they said they really liked about uh, the learnings. They really got the messages. They also liked to play and see how their own decisions uh, ended up in different endings throughout the game. Uh, you will see, as po Wendy pointed out, how the violence begins scaling after each episode and how not only you're making a decision as of, of really being uh, able to help the, 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 the girl that it's in the game, but also what happens if you are a bystander and don't make anything about it and just watch. Because it's also very important to know how you can develop tools throughout this process in order to also help end the violence, not only by being bullied or be the bully, but also how to not be a bystander through this process. Next. So these are some of the results we had. As Wendy pointed out, part of the objectives is that we wanted really advocacy because when they share this kind of information peer to peer is much more powerful. What we learned after the post test is that during the period of gameplay, they share all of the information that they have been learning with over 15 people, each one of the participants in average, which is really high. And it really helps us a, a, to, to reach a lot of more people with information as I pointed out peer to peer. Another thing that was very important is that 88% seek for more information, structural information, really how to help and how to really cope with all of this. So it's very important because then it not only ends when the gameplay ends, but then it just continue as it continued to build up. Here you have two extra QR codes because we know that you're short on time. The first one is a QR code that will drive you to the Population Media Center webpage where the case is pulled out. And then you will have a second QR code 
for a video case, a long video case, when you explain the whole process, what we were testing, and all the different results that we gain out of this. Next, please. Now I will share a small video of the participant testimonials so you see from their own mouth what they felt about the camps. un juego bonito e interesante eh, me pareció de que como que trataron de emitir un mensaje a, con el juego acerca de las personas de que no que no se llevan con las mujeres pero, o sea los hombres que no se llevan con las mujeres y, y las discriminan solo por ser mujeres y pues eh, el juego es todo interesante y sí, sí me gustó Muchas cosas, como valorar a las mujeres y que muchas cosas que no son solo para hombres, que hay varias cosas que son para mujeres y para hombres. Bastante bueno en los tres días que, de que estuvimos viniendo, eh, eh, como no a faltarle respeto a las mujeres o algo así, más bien eh, no abusar de poder o algo así, siempre respetar. pareció bastante interesante sobre respecto a las mujeres, pues los hay que tener de más, más respeto y bueno, como decía, el fútbol no solo es para mujeres, para hombres que digan, para los dos géneros. Yo hablaría con la persona que está haciendo crucero y no, no deja jugar a la persona tal, hablaría con él de que no, el juego es para las dos personas, para los dos tipos tanto hombre como mujer. Pues sí me gustó. <laughs> es algo divertido. Natalia, if it's okay, can I suggest we go to the next slide so we can fit in sure. our questions? Sure, don't worry. Right, thank you. So there you can see a little how this new project really stroke. So this is the last uh, the last camp we just ended last week. We went back to Proyecto Puente Belice with uh, younger generations. It's been 15 months since we last went there. And then we also had the opportunity to interview many of the children that have already played the game 15 months ago, just to see how that really changed their lives and the way that they have been behaving in how to really encourage others and help others and also how they help themselves. So out of this, next slide, please. From these uh, pilot projects in 219 and, and 223, we have uh, a lot of learnings. And I think that it's also very important not, also, not only to learn about things that we've done well, but also share among us peers, you know, also some of the failures and the things that we definitely need to take into accountability to be able to learn more. For example, one of the learnings that we had from the first camp that we changed in the second camp that was the facilitator uh, guide was really big and really wide. So we narrowed it down to be more easy for facilitators to then work by and facilitate. Another thing was each of the after each uh, episode ending uh, research that we did, we turn it just into one pretest and posters in order to make the gameplay more fluid. So that was another learning that we took from the first camp. And uh, another one was really how to have in presence um, facilitation really helps them a lot, like the engagement, the trust, the amount of people that just want to seek help afterwards, it's very important to be prepared. We have a whole facilitator training of really what are the next steps, how to listen to trouble, because these are such sensitive picture, uh, topics, and then how to move forward. Then we also have two extra learnings. One is how to build more skills. What we have learned is how to really plan different scenarios for different kinds of camps that we are going to be developing, how to do training of facilitators in different formats, and also how to 
rearrange the facilitator guy in order to be more useful. All of this was tested now in the new pilot lab that we developed in 2023, and it all worked very, very well. And then also it's a matter of scaling up. How can we definitely make this work all around the world? We have already tested this game in refugee camps. We have already uh, already tested in El Salvador, in Lebanon. So we have been South Africa. So we have been moving it like all around the world. But really in order to scale up, we have now built different modules of how you can incorporate uh, different parts of the facilitator guide on and off. So you always keep the high quality of the game and the way you want to change uh, behavior. We're also tested a lot of how much ratio we need about facilitation for classes over 35 students and testing modular of 45 a minute uh, interventions because we know that most classes and most camps will take almost for 45 to 90 minutes. So we're tested all of that in order to be able to module and scale up as fast as we can, so then we can go or keep on going global. Next, please. So this is a little about the evolution I talked about. So how we have been moving toward not only doing first as a, a mobile game that was really for desktops, but now something that it can be done by cell phones. The game is downloaded, so it doesn't need internet in order to gameplay. So that's very important because we know that that, that it's a really hard thing. So once you're already downloaded, you can go on and do all the gameplay without internet access. And now we're also seeing how we can do the pre-test and post this offline. So then once you hit Wi-Fi, then it can be uploaded. And I saw that there was like some questions about, uh, you know, the privacy skills, everything it's anonymous. We have consents of course of parents and also releases from parents and children in order to do all the video cases. So all of this is definitely taken into accountability and we also submit everything to IRB approvals. So everything it's uh, among ethics. So we can definitely do all of this as it's supposed to be. Next, please. That's it, thank you so much. Thanks, Nati. Yes, and those are like our emails. <laughs> that Stephanie also pointed out, uh, we also have other emails. If you like want to have conversations and see how you can make breakaway a reality in your own countries. Great. Uh, thank you so much uh, for all of those wonderful presentations. And we're, we're sorry that we ran out of uh, some of our time for this Q&A session, but I'm hoping that uh, some of the folks might be able to stay on for a couple more minutes just to respond to the questions. And of course, these will be sent out uh, with the recording and those slides. Uh, so we've had several questions in the chat come through about privacy and consent and data ownership. I know that some of those have been responded to in the chat, but I just would like to open up the floor to our panelists for any additional thoughts you might have. Um, in order to, just to add, you know, in order to do the assessment, we had to go through um, IRB approval as well. So the, all of those consents were, were part of that IRB approval. Now, um, someone, once we have it uploaded onto the Apple Store or, or the Play Store, um, Google Play Store, children will be able to play to play it. And we're working on um, a notification that we will have when they. Great. Thanks, Wendy. Um, since uh, we've had a couple of folks respond to this one, I think we can move on. Uh, I, a great comment just came up, and I think something we all in the SBC and demand generation world know well, just because we build it does not mean people will come. How have you gone ahead to promote this game to youth and to your target audiences? How have you, how have you built out the demand? I think I'll just jump in, I think, because our work is slightly distinct from um, what the other presenters have shared, but very quickly and, and also largely from a design uh, perspective rather than an implementation um, perspective. But these games um, that we've created, they are um, specifically for community engagement um, 
and with a view to uptake of um, research, participation in research or uptake of specific products or, or just promoting information about them in specific communities. Um, and that being said, um, they are being tested or will also be rolled out in all sort of controlled settings rather than being made publicly available. So it's a slightly different um, sort of a purpose uh, for these ones, but the game and the board game and so on that we've created that definitely has potential for, for larger outreach. Just, just wanted to share that. Thanks, Faith. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in. Um, I mean, our audience is, um, you know, staff in NGOs, humanitarian actors. So um, we reach out to those, you know, different networks um, of, uh, of humanitarian actors, um, specifically like those that work in different sectors. So like there's, you know, global WASH consortiums or, you know, RCCE and et cetera, all down the line. Um, but we also have our own network um, of thousands of different people who subscribe to, to Ready. So, you know, we get it out through, through, then, through that way. Um, and then again, through our different trainings and workshops. Um, so, so that's mostly what we, what we rely on. But it's a it's a full team effort, um, and everyone on the team is responsible for um, for doing work on you know disseminating information about about the game. Great, thanks, Kat. Uh, when we also uh, yeah, just quickly when we first when the the first iteration of the game was an online game and we are in um, the development of it was with support from UNFPA. So it was through some of the UNFPA channels. We specifically launched it during the 2010 FIFA World Cup timing and we worked with an organization there in South Africa. That's where it was um, where the hub was. Uh, and we actually had it on CDs and we distributed them on DC. Uh, CDs through uh, UNFPA partners. Um, and now that is a big question, you know, that is a question, how are we going to um, reach out to the audience? We're still putting together, really refining the package, what we consider the package, the toolkit for the for Breakaway. Um, after this last uh, pilot in Guatemala, uh, we're in a really good place for that. So We'll be thinking about that question more, more deliberately. Great, thank you. Uh, and I wanna be cognizant of time. So maybe as our last question, I would like to just, we had a couple uh, questions about accessibility, uh, both in low digital literacy settings, as well as in uh, areas where data costs are high. Any comments or recommendations to, to figuring out how to help uh, reach those folks. I'll just jump in with just a, a quick one. It's more on the um, bandwidth than anything, but um, you know, for for outbreak ready, like we use we use it in workshops and trainings in low bandwidth areas. Um, and so what we usually do is is download it and um, you know put it on flash drives, and and then everyone you know. Puts it on their their laptop, um, but it's the the games are specifically designed for you know low bandwidth areas. Um, for us, the literacy um, piece isn't as big of an issue because it's geared more toward professionals. But um, but the bandwidth is is a much bigger issue for us. Thanks, Catherine. We also designed the game so that it, it's uh, for low bandwidth um, devices, tablets, or phones. Um, the the accessibility question, though, too, is one thing that we had hoped that we could do is do voiceover. Um, mm -hmm. It gets a little more complicated. Where we are set up to do to um, to have this game translated in multiple languages. You saw it in Spanish, right? We have it in Spanish ready to go. It had been translated in uh, French and Portuguese previously, the older the older versions. Um, that would be a next step, but uh, that's very expensive. Thanks, Wendy. Any final thoughts? 
Maybe one one final thought on the sorry, going back to the the bandwidth again. One thing that we recognized as being really important is that uh, the game continuously continually save on the gameplay, so that if there are bandwidth issues, at their their play is at lost. So um, so that was really uh, key for us as well. And also the size of the game, I think it's important because people are really cautious about how much side things are that they're downloading into their own mobiles or into their own tablets. So also that was taken to accountability. We did not commit with the quality, but we are uh, using as, as, large, as less space as we really need to the downloading of the game and then it's automatically saved into your own device so then you can keep on moving forward so i think that just taking all of those things into accountability when you're designing it's very important because the whip bands as we said it's a reality in most developing countries and we have to to really be conscious about it and then with data specifically we do know that in most developed countries over uh 90% it's prepaid phones so that what happens is that they usually upload uh, a small amount of money each day which can lead probably to navigating one of two hours so that to take that into accountability of how much time your game may take to download just so then you can definitely afterwards then that doesn't that doesn't really consume as much data so I think that that's that's important they download other uh apps that are useful. So it's just a matter of knowing if, if it is useful for you or not. Thanks for those additions, Natalia. I think we've all been in that position where we're furiously deleting things from our phone so we can take some more pictures. Uh, so that's a, that's a great point. Um, and I, I just want to thank all of our panelists again uh, for all of uh, the work and time that they've put into these wonderful presentations. We, we really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for all joining and sticking with us these, these 10 extra minutes. Uh, it looks like we've had some great back and forth in the chat, and we will be sure to include those additional resources and links that folks have posted in there as well. Um, be sure to watch out for future Springboard events. Uh, and until then, uh, thanks everyone and have a great week.